The turret is a strategically important tank module. It's responsible for the protection of the crew and the vehicle itself. The main armament, a cannon, is also mounted there. But is it really necessary? Can a tank without a turret still be considered a tank? The Swedish designers proved that it can. The first tanks with rotating turrets appeared in 1917. Since then, designers have worked to improve this vital mechanism of the combat vehicle. In the mid-1960s, a turretless Swede made its first steps in the land of the Vikings. The Swedes nicknamed their new tank STRV-103. The designers removed the main design feature of the combat vehicle. The tank was so unusual that even frostbitten Swedes were surprised. Stefan Carlsson, director of Arsenal and Tank Museum, knows all about the strange features of the STRV-103 firsthand. During his service on this exotic vehicle, he studied every bolt of the unique S-Tank. In times after the Second World War, Sweden bought a lot of different tanks from other countries to test and to try their capabilities. And they realized that a heavy tank was suitable for the Swedish terrain. And because of this, they set up a program to develop a new Swedish tank, a heavy tank, uh, that had certain options. And that became the KARV project that was meant to be a heavy tank for the Swedish army. But at the same time, all of a sudden, we got the opportunity to buy Centurion tanks from Great Britain. And because of this, they decided to buy these tanks from Great Britain and this KRV project was a bit postponed for the future. After the Second World War, the main threat for the Swedes was a possible Soviet invasion if a Third World War broke out. For the Swedish army, repelling the Soviet invasion was almost the only type of battle it was preparing for. The limited budget didn't allow Sweden to buy enough foreign tanks to confront the Soviet forces. The ambitious plans gave way to Scandinavian pragmatism. The Swedish generals relied on quality, not on quantity. It was decided to build a park of combat vehicles by the country's own efforts. The designers were assigned the task of developing a drastically new tank. A standard battle scenario in which the STRV would be used would probably be the following. Tanks set up ambushes behind these stone fences in the woods. The Soviet tank column appears. The Swedish tank lifts itself up, fires all of its shells, and then, using the turbine controlled by the radio operator, runs away quickly to set up the next ambush and replenish its ammunition. It should also be something that would be very easy for a conscript soldier to be trained on. So these were some of the ideas that uh, were put into this uh, project as, as a start. Unlike other countries who strived to create versatile combat vehicles, the Swedes focused on just a few main parameters, high protection and improved maneuverability. The S-Tank met and surpassed its requirements, but at the cost of its turret. When the S-Tank was, was uh, developed during the 1950s, uh, most tanks in the world did not have the capability of firing on on the move. The st stabilization of the gun wasn't efficient enough, so they could fire the first round, but that was probably not a hit, so they had to stop to fire the next round. And since there were no solution uh, at that time to, to find a way of, of making this stabilization system better, uh, they thought that it's not necessary for a tank to be able to fire on the move. So that's why they decided we remove the turret and put the gun directly into the chassis to make it more, uh, more of a compact tank with a low silhouette. 
To improve the tank's protection while keeping its weight low, the Swedes put the front glossy's plate at a very high slope. You need to understand that the front armor of the STRV-103 is 40 mm thick. For perspective, the T-34 that entered service in 1939, a little less than 20 years before the STRV, had 45 mm of front armor. Due to this, the oblique angle armor configuration almost guaranteed that the enemy shells would ricochet. And at the front of the tank, it also had a bar armor, which was kept secret until 1992. And this is a kind of bar armor that you will find on many tanks and uh, armored personnel carriers today. So that was probably the first time it was ever used on a tank. The STRV-103 became a living legend due to its combined powertrain and internal layout. There was a classic diesel Rolls-Royce engine and a gas turbine Boeing engine in its engine compartment. They could work either autonomously or together. The gun ran along the axis of the whole hull. The loading mechanism was installed at the back. There were three crew members, driver, commander and radio operator. The low height of the turretless Swede as low as 1 meter 90 centimeters, was fully compensated for by its internals. This is the only tank in the world that can be driven and fired by one man in the crew. But there is the same controls for the driver and the commander. So if necessary, the commander can take over and both drive and fire the gun himself. So you only have to be one in the tank to be able to do everything, and that's unique for this tank. The Swedes used a combined engine, a diesel engine and a gas turbine for the first time in the world. The vehicle was quite fast. To improve its rate of fire, the Swedes used a magazine-type loading system. To aim the gun at the target, tankers needed to change tank position each time by traversing its hull in two dimensions. This maneuver looked like an armored vehicle dance, and the improved hydraulic suspension led that dance. Because the gun is fixed in the chassis, you have to use the whole tank to traverse the gun sideways and up and down. And this is done by hydraulics. The Swedes managed to make their tank traverse almost as fast as the turrets of standard tanks. It even allows the STRV to act like an ordinary tank in an attack. The STRV was often compared with Western tanks. The Americans and British invited the Swedes to the testing ground maneuvers, and the results were quite positive. In 1967, the Norwegians did comparative tests of the STRV-103 and Leopard 1. The turretless Swede put on a good show, but its high cost frightened the potential customers away. It was twice as much as the cost of the German Predator, this tank can sit down, put its belly on the ground. It can lower itself and hide behind a fence, some bushes, or any natural cover. It can also lift itself up quite high. The gun mounted in the upper parts of its fixed angled cabin allows it to expose only the slightest part of its frontal projection above cover, fire, and then lower itself back down. The less than intimidating look of the STRV-103 was balanced by its powerful armament. The vehicle was equipped with a 105mm Bofors L7 gun, developed for the British vehicles, but the Scandinavians showed their Nordic temper here as well. This gun was used in the Centurions. At that time, it was almost the best gun in the Western world. Also, the Swedes made it longer, so if the standard L7 had 56 calibers in length, the Swedish designers mounted a 62 caliber long gun. This means they added more muzzle velocity and got more penetration, which allowed the STRV to fight successfully against all tanks in the world at that time. In theory, its improved shell could damage even the promising Soviet tanks of that time. It had good chances against even the T-60 Let's compare the STRV-103 with a classic World War II tank, the T-34, for its off-road speed, but make it more difficult for the Scandinavian vehicle. Let it race in reverse, and the Swede will easily come in first, because the STRV-103 is the only tank in the world capable of moving at up to 50 km per hour in reverse. There are many bodies of water in Sweden. 
a lot of rivers and lakes. That's why the Swedes equipped the STRV with a very original fording system. The crew would set up a three-meter-high covering above the tank and ford the river by its bed. The driver would be located near the side of this covering at the back and control the vehicle with the help of cables. They used duplex drive, like the Sherman tanks during World War II. There was a high rubber-coated tube that was lifted up from the frame on the tank sides. It was like a cooking pot with the tank itself at the bottom, and this pot could swim. The unusual technical solutions of the S-Tank inspired designers around the world. During the creation of the Makava tank, the Israeli engineers borrowed the idea of putting the engine at the front from the Swedes. This solution provides additional crew protection. Using all these new features in one tank that early was down to the Swedish know-how. They managed to create a rather effective vehicle with fixed armament. Generally speaking, this doesn't happen very often. The designers constantly modernized the S-Tank, which became a national heritage. The STRV-103 was equipped with modern visibility systems and dynamic armor. The designers also experimented with the armament and ballistic computers, but having never showed itself on the battlefields, the turretless Swede took its well-deserved rest in 1997. It might be said that this is the most anti-tank tank in the world. To my mind, it's one of the best tanks of the second half of the 20th century. I mean, the Swedes were very wise in not trying to keep up with other nations when creating a tank, instead optimizing it for a particular task, for their particular theater of operations. As a tank crew member, it was a fantastic tank if it worked uh, and did not have any technical problems. Uh, I have, myself, I have been, been in this tank uh, several times uh, during maneuvers, so uh, it is fantastic as a defensive tank and it's very easy to drive, very easy to, to fire uh, and you can easily uh, hit another target or an attacking enemy if you stand in the right type of, of uh, gun position.